welcome back. Today we are going to be talking about measuring and recording vital signs. So in this unit we're going to teach you how to take vital signs. Now vital signs are a source of information um, about body condition. So if you are sick then your vital signs may change. If you have a fever your temperature is going to be elevated. That's the definition of a fever. If you are in pain, your blood pressure or your pulse may be elevated. Um, if you are having trouble breathing, your respirations may be elevated. So vital signs are a very, very important thing to help, especially the nurse, figure out what's going on with a resident. So it's important to know how to take them and do them correctly. So included in our vital signs are temperature, pulse, respiration, blood pressure. Uh, measuring height is included in this unit, although it is not a vital sign, and measuring weight was found in uh, unit 10. Another vital sign that we'll teach you about is how to measure an oxygen level. So we check, um, if you've heard the term pulse ox, that's checking the amount of oxygen floating around in your blood, which is another very, very important thing. And the sixth vital sign is pain. So we will teach you about pain as well. Temperature is a measurement of the amount of heat in the body. So a healthy body maintains a balance between the heat produced and the heat lost. So how much heat you make and how much heat you lose. So temperature is created as the body changes food to energy. So we're always going to have some kind of temperature. If you don't have any kind of temperature, that's kind of not a good thing. Uh, so temperature is also lost from the body to environment by contact. So if you touch something cold, you're going to lose some body heat to that um, perspiration. So when you sweat, breathing, and there's some other different means. Um, a lot of the times kind of uh, losing heat through the top of your head. So if you just had a shower and say you don't have any hair on the top of your head, you're going to lose a lot of heat through the top of your head if you don't have it covered. So there are some different types of thermometers that we can use. Um, there's an electronic thermometer, chemically treated paper, and a glass thermometer. The electronic thermometer is going to be the most common that we see. Now these are going to be on your vital sign equipment at your facility if you've got one of the little rolling towers of vital sign equipment or um, just in individual by itself. So the thermometer can be either a simple style, a probe style, um, and they're always battery powered so they're usually rechargeable. And so these are really nice. You don't have to keep them plugged into the wall in order to use them. Um, so you can carry them around with you and do whatever you need to do. So the second type is a chemically treated paper. Now these are going to be used a lot in hospitals, um, especially around babies. So these chemically treated paper or plastic strips are going to change color to register the temperature reading. And these are disposable. You just use them one time, stick them on the forehead, it reads, and then you toss it. The last type is the glass thermometer. Now these you probably will never see in practice. These are going to be a glass tube with measurement markings. They're very, very easily broken. So if you drop it on a glass or a tile floor, it's probably going to break. So they definitely present a potential for injury to not only you, but to your residents. So they used to use mercury or gallon stand or colored alcohol. So the mercury is no longer used in long-term care facilities because there are a lot of environmental hazards when that thermometer breaks. The mercury is really, really hard to clean up and you have to clean it up a certain way. So if you drop that glass thermometer, it breaks and the mercury leaks out. Leaks out. You can't just take a paper towel and wipe it up. The mercury is going to bead and if you try to wipe it up, all it's going to do is push the bead along the floor. So it's kind of like, kind of like the Terminator movies when he melts on the floor and just kind of slides. That's like the mercury in the glass thermometers. So 
if you ever do see one of these, um, a glass thermometer, even if it doesn't contain mercury, it might contain that colored alcohol. Um, there's an oral, a security, and a rectal. And a lot of places will not use uh, rectal temperatures anymore just because there is a chance to perforate or put a hole in the colon. So that would very much not be good if that happened to your resident. So oral temperature is going to be the most common way that you're going to take a temperature. Normal Fahrenheit oral temperature is 98.6 degrees. That is the gold standard. That's what we're looking for. So if you go to take a temperature and it is 98.6 perfect, they're right on the money. The range for still being normal is 97.6 to 99.6. So if you get somebody that's normally a 98.6 person and their temperature today is 99.2, that's okay. They still are doing all right. However, if it's 100.3, that's outside of our range and that means that they have a fever. Or if it's 96.8, that's outside of our range and it means that they are a term called hypothermic. Hypo meaning low, therm meaning temperature. So they have a outside of the range low temperature. So rectal temperature, this one again is not used very often anymore. Some places may still use that but um, not very often. 99.6 degrees Fahrenheit is your gold standard because this is a lot closer to the blood in your body getting a rectal temperature and putting um, the thermometer in the rectum getting near the rectal wall goes straight to the blood supply um, so you're getting a really really close temperature to the direct blood temperature of your body so 99.6 is our normal our range is 98.6 to 100.6. So when we talk about temperatures and we'll talk about documenting temperatures, it's very important to know which way you took it. Because if you took an oral temperature and it was 100.5, that would indicate somebody has a fever. But if you took it rectally and it was 100.5, that's still within normal range. So it's very important to know which way you took it and document it correctly. So axillary, this is one where it goes under the arm. So axillary is under the arm. So what you do is you have somebody lift up their arm and you put the temperature probe in their armpit. Now make sure that you get the tip of the probe kind of right in the middle of the cavity of their armpit because if you stick it all the way through, it's not gonna give you a correct reading. Kind of like when you cook chicken at home and you have to stick a meat thermometer in it but you don't want to get it right on the bone you want to get it kind of in the middle of the meat same concept with axillary you want to get it right in the middle of the armpit and you know then you have your accurate reading otherwise if you go all the way through it's going to read the air temperature and the air temperature is not going to be the same as your body so the axillary 97.6 degrees fahrenheit is your normal temperature. So a lot of places will have you just add a degree to figure out what's supposed to be normal because we always think of oral as being the um, oral is usually the gold standard one so we always kind of think okay if we take an axillary temperature it's 97.8 well then we add a degree to get their true body true body temperature. So if you get an axillary temperature of 96.8, that's normal for axillary, not for oral. Again, this is why it's very, very important to know how to chart everything. Then your tympanic. This one is where you put the probe in the ear. Now make sure you are very gentle with this and don't try to stick the probe in further than it will go because you can do a lot of damage to the ear that way. So the gold standard for this one is the same as our oral, 98.6 with a range of 97.6 to 99.6. And remember where you chart is important as well. 
So we need to know our residents quote unquote normal temperature range before assuming that their temperature reading is out of the acceptable range. So what if you have somebody that normally has a body temperature of 97.5? that's right outside of our normal range it's a little bit low so say they had a 99.6 temperature and their normal is 97.5 that's two full degrees 2.1 full uh, degrees above their normal body temperature for them that definitely indicates that they have a fever uh, somebody else that is on the upper side of normal so we don't consider them having a fever, but someone else that has a lower than normal body temperature, 99.6 is a fever. So make sure that you know the normal. So situations that will cause higher than normal readings, if somebody has just eaten warm food and you take an oral temperature, sometimes the time of the day, infection, infection is a big one. Temperature a lot of times is your first sign that somebody has an infection. So sometimes some other diseases um, can cause that. If you've got people's metabolism kind of going crazy, it's gonna increase their body temperature. So there's also some situation that can cause lower than normal readings. So faulty technique, if you're not doing it correctly, if you've got the temperature probe all the way through the armpit rather than kind of in the middle, eating cold food, so if you've got cold food in your mouth or you're just eating something cold, your mouth is going to stay cold for a little bit. So definitely eating cold food can give you a lower than normal reading. The time of day, again, and having a dry mouth because you need kind of that saliva to help carry that temperature up to the probe. So the Fahrenheit thermometer, if you are using one of those glass thermometers, is going to have long and short lines. So Fahrenheit is what we typically use in the US. It's part of our, our standard system is Fahrenheit. So if you ever see the temperature outside, today it's supposed to be 85 degrees. That's Fahrenheit. So keep in mind, Fahrenheit is what we normally use to talk about temperature. So they'll have long and short lines. Every other long line is an even degree from 94 to 108. Short lines in between are 0.2 or 2 tenths of a degree. So you'll usually have an even number whenever you take somebody's temperature with one of these glass thermometers. So you'll not be able to get like a 97.7. It'll be either 96, 97.6 or 97.8. So then you have the centigrade thermometer or Celsius. This one is a lot more commonly used in Europe, um, Canada, basically the rest of the world except for the US. And some of the hospitals will actually chart in centigrade or Celsius just because it is more um, widely accepted. So each long line is going to measure one degree and the degrees range from 34 to 42 degrees Celsius or centigrade and each short line is 0.1 or one tenth of a degree. So you will get kind of a maybe 35.7 reading on that. If you ever want to know what the, um, what the temperature is in Celsius when you took it in Fahrenheit, you can always Google a conversion thing for it. It's kind of hard to remember all of it, but you can always look it up on the internet and see um, what the conversion would be for that. So to read the glass thermometer, make sure that you hold it at eye level, hold the stem at eye level, turn it so you can see all the numbers, the long and the short lines, and turn it back and forth until you can see the silver or red lines and where the colored alcohol or whatever it is has got up to. Read the nearest degree long line and then read the nearest tenth degree short line. So the oral temperature, this is going to be the most common way that you can check somebody's um, temperature. This is going to be where you put the thermometer underneath their tongue and have them close their mouth. 
So this is going to be used in almost all situations unless it's contraindicated. So some different reasons why you may not want to use an oral temperature. If you have a resident that's combative, that is not understanding and they don't want to have their temperature taken that way, you know, you don't want to put something in their mouth and have them bite it and break their teeth. That would be very, very bad. Um, some other reasons might be if someone is on an oxygen mask, then that will dry out their mouth and give an accurate, an inaccurate reading. Also, if someone is unresponsive and can't, you know, doesn't know, they can hold their mouth closed, they're not able to respond to that. Or if somebody has had a stroke and can't hold their mouth closed. So those are some different reasons why you would not want to do um, an oral thermometer. Another thing that you need to think about, how we talked about eating or drinking will change the accuracy of your reading and will change your um, results. So your, if you have somebody that just ate or drank, you need to wait at least 10 to 20 minutes before you can take an oral temperature. 10 to 20 minutes between when they've had something to eat or drink to when you can take an oral temperature. Write that down. That may be a test question. <laughs> So some key points for the glass or the digital thermometers. We want to prepare the thermometer for accurate reading. Always follow infection control guidelines and resident safety and make sure that we follow our facility policy and procedure for the time to register. So if you're using a glass thermometer, you want to use the person's own personal thermometer. Each person should have their own if they're glass. Um, if they're soaking in disinfectant, make sure to rinse it under cold water because the hot water will actually cause the mercury to expand or the uh, colored alcohol to go up the tube and give you an inaccurate reading. You want to dry it from stem to bulb and the bulb is the part, the little silver part that goes directly underneath their tongue. You want to check it for breaks, cracks, and chips. Shake it down to 94 degrees Fahrenheit or 34 degrees centigrade. Now this is really important um, that you do this correctly and have a good firm hold on it <laughs> because if you are trying to shake the thermometer down and you accidentally let go of it or it slips out of your hand, it's going to fall on the floor and likely break. That would not be good. Then your facility is out of a thermometer and you're probably may have to pay for it but also that glass going everywhere may be dangerous to you and to your residents so you want to use a plastic cover per facility policy and remove the plastic cover to read it so what you would do is of course have your hands clean either hand sanitizer or washing them if you're going to come in contact with saliva a lot of, if somebody has a lot of secretions in their mouth, you want to use gloves. So wash your hands, put your gloves on, put a plastic cover on, have the person open their mouth, lift up their tongue, put the bulb of the thermometer underneath their tongue, put their tongue down, close their mouth, wait at least two or three minutes or per your facility policy for the reading. Then take the thermometer out of their mouth, get rid of the plastic cover, and then check your results and read the thermometer. So you want to wipe the thermometer down with a tissue to remove any mucus that may have gotten on it and then use cold water to rinse it before you store it in a container with disinfectant. And just, you know, we always think about using hot water to get rid of all the germs with everything, especially when we wash our hands. But again, the hot water will cause that mercury to expand and may give us inaccurate readings. So we want to use cold water and then put it in the chemical disinfectant. So we always, always, always want to use our standard and bloodborne precautions, which is again why we wear gloves if we do this procedure. And then we want to follow our policy and procedure for our time to register. The rectal route can be used when the oral route is unsafe or inaccurate, such as if you have the person that's unresponsive, that can't hold their mouth closed, um, that's on oxygen, whatever the case is. So if the resident is not reliable, um, if the resident has a dry or inflamed mouth, those can be a good uh, indications to use the rectal route. So we want to, again, prepare the thermometer for accurate reading, make sure that we have our infection control and disinfectant. We'll talk about placement, 
and resident safety, we absolutely want to keep the resident safe and then follow your facility procedure for the time to register. So you want to make sure to get the resident usually on their side, one of those sims position, the sims position would be the best for that. So kind of get them on their side, kind of on their stomach, um, make sure that they're comfortable as much as possible. You always want to lubricate the end of the rectal thermometer for easy insertion and to prevent tissue injury because that is sensitive tissue in that area. So you wanna make sure that that's um, really lubricated well and that it was going to slide easily. So you wanna hold the thermometer in place so that it is not lost into the rectum or broken. Because the rectal muscles are very, very strong and people will react to you using um, the thermometer and putting it in the rectum, their muscles may start to clench up and it will pull the thermometer in. So make sure that you hold that thermometer in place so that it's not lost into the rectum or broken. So a glass thermometer is gonna re remain in the rectum for two minutes or is required by your facility policy. And you wanna make sure that you keep this, um, keep this procedure private because their buttock and their anus are exposed. So you wanna make sure that you have the curtain closed, have the door shut, have the windows closed, um, and only expose what you need. Only uncover ex just what you need and cover them up when you're finished. So make sure that you wipe up any extra lubricant when you're finished as well, because if you were generous with the lubricant, sometimes that will get on the outside um, in their anus or their buttocks. So you wanna wipe that off and try not to embarrass the resident. Don't try to draw attention to it and um, you know, obviously not make fun of them. So we don't wanna do that at all. So um, just keep in mind that it may be an embarrassing procedure for them. And think about if you had to get that done on yourself how you would want someone to treat you. So always, always keep that in mind. So the tympanic route or the ear route is one of the most accurate ones if done properly. So if the technique is not correct, there's some different errors in reading that will result. So you want to make sure to prepare the thermometer for accurate reading, which this is just kind of making sure it has fresh batteries in it and that it you know turns on correctly that it's not going to give you some kind of error message so we want to always 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 follow our infection control and resident safety and then follow our time to register so the tympanic route is where they have a probe that is gently inserted into the ear and it always has a little plastic cover on it and their plastic covers are disposable so just get a new one each time. Pull the ear back and up for adults and be very, very gentle with this because remember our elderly people have very thin skin and sometimes, you know, not a whole lot of fat padding or good circulation. So you want to just be very gentle with that so you don't tear their skin. So the temperature is going to be measured within one to three seconds which is great. So that's very, very easy to use. The tympanic thermometers are used a lot of times because they are comfortable and they are non-invasive. You don't have to, you know, you kind of put stuff in the ear a little bit, but it comes right back out. So much, much easier to do. There's also fewer microbes in the ear or germs or pathogens. So there's a lot less risk of infection with this. And if you use that probe cover every time, then that's gonna cut down a whole lot. So the reasons why you wouldn't want to use a tympanic thermometer, if you have ear drainage, or if you have somebody with blood in their ear, or ear infection, or their ear hurts, you wanna find a different route. So always follow your standard precautions of bloodborne pathogen precautions. I would say use gloves every time that you do this, because you are putting your fingers on their skin, you might come in contact with, you know, earwax or something else that's just kind of gross and might be infectious material if you don't, you know, know that they're draining th from their ears. So always put your gloves on after you've cleaned um, washing or hand sanitizer. And then follow your facility policy with the time to register. Now these tympanic um, thermometers, most of the time you just 
put the probe in their ear and push a button and it'll read. That's all you do. Then when you're finished with that, discard the cover and then you'll use whatever approved um, disinfectant wipe. Usually alcohol wipes or some kind of um, industrial cleaner for that and make sure that you give it time to dry because you don't want to put that cleaner in somebody else's ear. So the axillary route, this is used when a lot of other methods are unsafe or inaccurate or if you have somebody that is trying to fight you then you can do this one a little bit better or somebody that's unresponsive or someone that you know can't stand to have their ears touched this is a really really good method so this method may provide less consistent readings than other routes if it is not done correctly so we want to always do our preparing infection control make sure you got your good placement um, keep your resident safety make sure that you talk to your resident while you're doing this tell them I need you to lift up your arm for me. I'm going to put the temperature or the thermometer in there. I'm going to close your arm down. Now we wait. And then when it's finished, okay, we're all done. You can lift up your arm and I'll take it out now. So always, 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 not just with your um, temperature readings, with everything, explain what you're doing to your resident. Even if they have dementia, they still may be able to catch some of it. So your axillary side or underarm must be dry. So if you've got somebody that's really, really sweaty, you might dry it off first before you start to do that route. So do not use the axillary site right after a bath because after a bath or a shower, a lot of times that hot water is going to open up your blood vessels and bring more blood to the surface of your body. So it's gonna make you a little bit hotter until you start losing all that heat from your head. So make sure that you wait a little bit after um, somebody's had a bath. If you're using a glass thermometer, it stays under the arm five to 10 minutes. So that's quite a long time if you're using that glass thermometer. Most of the time, if you're using one of the electronic devices, it only takes a minute or two if it's done correctly. Again, always follow your standard of bloodborne precautions and allow the time to register per your facility policy. So the temporal artery, this is another way that you can take a temperature. So this is the really cool ones that kind of go um, across the forehead and then to the side of the head. So you want to just gently, gently stroke across that temporal artery. It's the same temperature of the blood that's coming from the heart. So this is a really good, accurate method. So use the side of the head that's exposed. So if you've got somebody lying on their right side, then their left side is gonna be facing up. So you don't wanna to try to go from their, you know, middle of their forehead over to the right side because it's not gonna be accurate if their face has been on the pillow for a while and it's getting hot. So place the thermometer at the side of the forehead between the hairline and the eyebrows and then slide the thermometer across the forehead. So. When you go to work at your facility, they will teach you how to do these. Some will slide across the forehead, some will just get to the temporal artery on the side of the forehead and they won't move anywhere from there. So just follow whatever your facility tells you. So it'll read your temperature display and it's very quick. And these can be used for residents that are confused and resistant to care. So you can still tell them, you know, I'm going to take your temperature, I'm just going to take it across your forehead, and they'll kind of sometimes understand, but it's much, much easier, less traumatic for somebody than trying to stick something in their mouth or stick something in their ear or put it under their arm or definitely less traumatic than the rectal. So this is a much, much better alternative for that. So the digital thermometers are going to measure anywhere from six to 60 seconds. Some of them may take a little bit longer and that's okay, just whatever your facility policy is. So the disposable oral thermometers, the dots will change when the colors are heated and these are only used once. These are not gonna be used very often because they could probably get expensive if you keep using all these disposable thermometers rather than using one you can reuse and just change the probe covers on it. So the temperature sensitive tape, the color changes in response to heat 
and the tape is applied to the forehead or the abdomen and these measure in 15 seconds. Again, this is a disposable one so may not be used quite often um, just for cost factors. So some different things to report to the nurse. Notify the nurse immediately if the oral or tympanic temperature is below 97 or above 100 or if the rectal temperature is below 98 or above 101. So also notify the nurse if you're having difficulty obtaining temperature. So say your resident is not being cooperative, they do not want you to take their temperature at all, and they say, nope, I'm not doing it. Okay. So you've tried again and they agree, well, okay, I'll let you do it. Well, then they get frustrated halfway through and they don't let you finish. Or if you have, you know, a resident says, oh yeah, I'll let you take it. And then for some reason, the thermometer doesn't ever read or it takes forever reading. So let the nurse know that way, just in case there's any kind of equipment malfunction, or if the nurse is needing to kind of get with you about your technique to make sure that it's correct. So when you record or document your temperature, you want to use the following symbols and always remember to follow your facility's policy on approved abbreviations because some facilities may not approve any abbreviations or have some different ones than what we've taught you in the course. So we will teach you what is generally accepted, but your facility may have something slightly different. So the oral temperature is going to be a capital O. So when you take an oral temperature, say you got a 98.4, then you will record it as 98.4 O. Rectal temperature, 99.4 R. Tympanic, 98.4 T, or according to your facility policy. They may not want to use a T because T can mean the same thing as temperature. So I've seen some places that will have TYM for tympanic. Then axillary is AX, so 97.4 AX. Let's talk about pulse. So pulse is a measurement of the number of times the heart beats in one minute. So this is a basic observation of how the heart and the circulatory system are functioning. And the heart will beat and relax, pushing blood through the arteries. So a normal or average pulse is going to be 60 to 100 beats per minute. And this part is definitely in your book, but 60 to 100 beats per minute. Each person has a rate that is normal for them. Some people are normal around 64. Some people are normal at 94. And that's okay. So that's why we have to keep in mind that just because we have a range, not everyone is going to fall at the same place in that range. So it should be regular in rate, rhythm, strength, and force. If you think about um, back in music class when you had a metronome, how it kind of, you know, ticked off the beats for you in the measures. So it's always, always regular. So your pulse should be very steady, have a regular rate, 60 to 100, regular rhythm, strength, and force. And we'll kind of talk about all those different things. So when we talk about pulse, we need to know that all of our variations in pulse should be reported to the nurse. Some of our elder pulses can be irregular just because of some different changes in the body and disease processes that are going on. So an abnormal rate can be distinguished by a pulse speed of less than 60 or more than 100. <clears throat> so a pulse speed of less than 60 counted for one full minute is considered low. The term for this is bradycardia, B-R-A-D-Y-C-A-R-D-I-A. 
DIA. Bradycardia, pulse speed of less than 60 for one full minute. So on the opposite end of the spectrum is a pulse speed of more than 100 for one full minute called tachycardia. T-A-C-H-Y-C-A-R-D-I-A. Brady means slow and tachy means fast and card deals with the heart. So a slow or a fast heart rate. The pulse rate can be increased by things such as exercise, activity, emotional distress, and fever. That's why it's really important to have a good, accurate pulse rate and to know what's normal for our residents and what's abnormal for them. So an abnormal rhythm can be described as beats that are not evenly spaced apart, such as skipped beats, extra beats, or an erratic pattern of beats. So if you have somebody that this may be one person that's normal rhythm. Abnormal rhythm maybe. That can be an abnormal rhythm. So an abnormal strength or force can be described as a bounding pulse where the pulse cannot be occluded or stopped by mild pressure so if you're checking a pulse site, say on the wrist, and we'll teach you how to do that, normally you can feel the pulse, and then if you push down a little bit, you can kind of feel it stop a little bit, or it will kind of diminish. So a bounding pulse is one that cannot be occluded by mild pressure, and it might feel like that. So a weak and thready pulse is one that can be occluded by slight pressure, a really really light pulse so the weak and thready pulse often will have a very very fast rate and weak and thready pulse can mean that somebody is dehydrated and maybe it kind of goes along with a low blood pressure a lot of times too so there's a few different ways that you can take a pulse one of the main ones that you might use is a radial pulse now this means that you are going to put your fingers on the person's wrist typically underneath their thumb, kind of down, down the line from their thumb, moving towards um, their elbow, and you're gonna feel their pulse there. So you want to use your second and third fingers and kind of feel for the bone in their wrist that's right next to their thumb, and then move in just a little bit, and you'll feel the pulse. And if you're practicing your, right now and you don't really feel it, don't worry about it. We're gonna practice this in Skills Lab too. So you want to um, make sure that you count for at least 30 seconds and multiply by two, and that's only if the, if the rhythm is regular. Count 60 seconds if it's irregular. So if you're getting that re nice regular rhythm and it kind of feels okay, it's not too fast, not too slow, you can count for 30 seconds and take it times two. But if it's irregular, then you want to always, always, always count for 60 seconds. So the apical pulse, this one's a little bit different. This one you need a stethoscope. So you need to listen to the heart directly through the skin. The radial pulse, you're kind of feeling the artery in that area, so you're feeling something um, that's coming away from the heart and delivering all of the blood and nutrients and everything out to your hand. The apical pulse, you're listening to the heart directly. So the apical pulse is going to be located on the left side of the chest below your nipple. And for women, you may have to have a woman lift her breast up in order to hear the apical pulse correctly. So you always want to use a stethoscope for this and count for a full minute. Again. If it's regular, you can take 60 times. You can take it for 30 seconds times two, but generally it's a good idea to count for a full minute. And the lub dub sound you hear is one beat. So you might hear. So each one of those is one heartbeat, 
one heartbeat, one heartbeat. So sometimes you'll take this um, apical pulse. If you ever do go on and do your med aid or go to nursing school, you'll mainly do the apical pulse to count an accurate pulse before you're giving a lot of heart medications. But this is a really, really good skill for a CNA to know as well, just in case you've got somebody maybe that has an amputation on one of their arms and you can't reach the other one. You can still take an apical pulse as long as you can reach their chest. So that's a good thing to know. So some other different places that you can check the pulse. You can check the pulse in the temporal artery so you can actually put your fingers up to your temple and feel it. There's a facial artery, don't worry about that one. The carotid artery, this is the one in your neck. Now if you're doing the carotid artery, make sure that you only use one side at a time. Because if you try to put your fingers up on the carotid artery on both sides at one time and maybe you're pressing a little bit to try to feel the pulse, that can occlude the, the carotid arteries and not get good blood flow to the brain. And that would not be a good thing. Then you have the brachial artery. This one's kind of above your elbow on the inside of your arm. The brachial is usually used pretty well to get a pulse on children or infants. So brachial, usually you won't use that on an adult. The radial artery is the one right on the inside of the wrist. There is a femoral artery pulse. That one's kind of in the groin. You as a CNA probably will not use this, but it's good to know where it is. The popliteal artery. This one is actually behind your knee. So you might be able to kind of feel behind the inside of your knee and feel a pulse there. Then your posterior tibial artery. This is right behind the inner ankle bone. And then your dorsalis pedis artery. This one is on the top of your foot. And that one's pretty cool to be able to feel. So always report those variations to your nurse. If you've got a change in a pulse from what is normal for somebody, even if it is within the normal range. So say somebody normally runs right around 64, well today they're 98. That's still within normal range, but that's a big jump. So definitely report that to your nurse. Report any pulses below 60 or over 100. So if you have any bradycardia or tachycardia. And notify if you have any difficulty obtaining the pulse. This is very important because if you go to take a radial pulse on somebody or any kind of pulse and you're having difficulty obtaining it, then let your nurse know because there may be a problem with the person's circulation of why you can't obtain that one. So you always want to record or document your pulse measurement and you would identi identify your apical pulse measurement with AP. Again, follow your facility policy with abbreviations, but usually AP is for apical pulse. Respirations are another vital sign that you will do. So respirations are counting the inspiration, which is the breath in, and the expiration, which is the breath out. It says respiration, but it's expiration. So each breath in and out is one respiration. So the normal or average adult respiratory rate is between 14 and 20 respirations per minute. So everyone will have that rate that is normal for them. So any variations should be reported to the nurse and our respirations can change. Um, they can be increased by exercise, fever, lung disease, and emotional stress. They also decrease by sleep, inactivity, pain, and medication. So we want to make sure to report any variations to the nurse. So some different variations in the character and rhythm. Dyspnea. This is an important term to know. Make sure that you know dyspnea. This is difficult or labored breathing and you use extra muscles for breathing. So if you have someone that has some kind of a lung disease and they say, oh, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, then they are experiencing dyspnea. So you can also see someone with shallow breathing. 
so their chest does not rise and fall very much. You can have someone with noisy breathing, gurgling, wheezing, or snoring sounds. And you can have irregular breathing. So this may be an irregular pattern where you have cycles of dyspnea, so you have cycles of difficulty breathing. They might be trying to breathe really fast, followed by periods of apnea. And apnea is an absence of breathing. So I know we've almost all heard the term sleep apnea, where you stop breathing while you're sleeping. Well, take the sleep part out of it and you have apnea. So people can have those periods where they're breathing really fast or having difficulty breathing, and then they stop breathing for a little bit, usually, you know, 10, 20 seconds. This is common when someone is at end of life when they are in the active dying process. They will have those periods of dyspnea followed by the apnea, and the apnea periods will get longer, and the apnea periods will get more frequent until they eventually stop breathing altogether. So counting respirations, just keep in mind that each respiration involves one inhalation, breath in, and one exhalation, breath out. So you want to count the respirations right after taking the pulse. And a good reason why we want to do this is because we don't want the resident to know what we're doing. We're not lying to them. <laughs> we're not doing that at all. We're not trying to be deceitful. But if you tell somebody, oh, I'm going to take your respirations. I'm going to watch you breathe. And you stare at their chest. A lot of times that's going to make somebody uncomfortable. So that's why we kind of do this without letting them know. So what you want to do is say you've taken their pulse, you're taking a radial pulse, you've counted it for the 30 seconds. Keep your fingers on that pulse site, or if you're doing an apical, keep your stethoscope on that pulse site. And count their respirations. Count that for 30 seconds out of the corner of your eye. So you're going to watch each chest rise and fall, and each chest rise and fall is one respiration. So count for 30 seconds and multiply by two. If you have abnormal respirations, such as those periods of dyspnea and apnea, or if somebody is breathing really fast, count it for a full 60 seconds. Always follow your facility policy, but these are some good guidelines. Another thing I like to do, just kind of a tip for you, is if you are using all of the vital equipment on the little vitals tower where they've got the automatic blood pressure cuff and they've got the little thing that you stick on the finger to check your pulse and then the temperature probe. I like to hook up the blood pressure cuff to somebody and while it's taking their blood pressure I'll kind of rest my hand on their shoulder on the back of their shoulder and feel their respiration so you can feel their chest rising and falling and sometimes people kind of like that it kind of um, kind of makes them feel like you're just standing there and being nice and being reassuring and um, just kind of kind of being a friend but um, I have an ulterior motive with that not just to be a nice person but also to get their respirations if they're using everything automatic so that I don't have to stop and you know count their respirations or pretend like I'm taking their pulse even though it's already done so that's something I like to do as well so always report any changes in your resident's respiratory rate from what's normal for them. Report any rates under 14 or over 24. And definitely, absolutely notify the nurse if you're having difficulty counting a respiratory rate. And then you want to record or document the respiratory rate. A lot of times, um, whenever you're charting vitals, if you put, you know, you put a T of 98.60 for oral. Then you say P65, then another comma R15. Great, that's good documentation of your vitals. Um, one last thing that I will say, another little tip that I just thought of, is if you have somebody that you're having to take vitals on them when they're sleeping and you have to wake them up to take vitals and Unfortunately, this is a reality of healthcare having to do that. We're not trying to be mean. We're trying to make sure people are still doing okay. So if you have somebody that you need to go take vitals on and they're sleeping, stop and count their respirations first. 
that's an easy thing that you can do. Yes, they might be decreased because they're sleeping. So if you get a decreased number, you know, count them again when somebody's awake, you know, after you've already woken them up to do their blood pressure and their pulse and everything. But you can always count their respirations when they're sleeping. Then they won't see you staring at their chest. Now, some people will wake up and notice you looking at them and just, you know, say, oh, it's just making sure you're doing okay. I'm coming to do your vitals. You can let them know. And that's not... You know, that's not untrue at all. But if people wake up and they see you kind of staring at them um, to see if they're breathing, it kind of freaks them out a little bit. So be discreet about it if somebody does wake up. So one of the other main, main, main vitals that you're going to take is a blood pressure. So the blood pressure is the force of the blood against the artery walls. So the blood pressure level will depend on the rate and strength of the heartbeat, the ease with which the blood flows through the arteries, and the amount of blood within the circulation system. So if you have somebody, say, that has narrowed arteries, and the arteries are the muscular tubes that take the blood away from the heart out to your body. So if you have somebody that has narrowed arteries, then the heart is going to have to work harder to pump against it. So their blood pressure is going to go up. Also, if somebody, say, is dehydrated, they may not have as much volume of blood circulating through their system, so their heart is not going to pump out as much, and that's going to cause their blood pressure to be low. The heart may try to compensate for that by you know, beating faster. So that's why you see those people with a weak thready pulse that have a low blood pressure. It kind of goes hand in hand with that. So some different terms. The systolic blood pressure. This is the force within the arteries when the heart contracts or squeezes and beats. This is going to be the highest pressure within the arteries and this is going to be not only the top number of the blood pressure, so you can see the little picture we have there, the SYS is 132, so it's the top number. It's also going to be the first sound heard when measuring a blood pressure, when you're taking a manual blood pressure without using a machine. So the diastolic pressure, this is the force within the arteries when the heart relaxes between beats and starts to refill. So you always will have a diastolic pressure. You think if you, you know, if the heart's relaxing, it's not actively beating that you wouldn't have a pressure. You do. It's a good thing. You're supposed to have a diastolic blood pressure. If you didn't, then all of the blood flow back to the heart wouldn't be as much, and eventually your heart would fail. So diastolic is going to be the lower number of the blood pressure so if you look on the little picture it says dia 78 so the diastolic is also going to be the level at which the pulse sounds change or cease so when you're taking a manual blood pressure you're going to hear the first sound when you're measuring it so you might hear a little space as you're measuring it um, before you hear a sound, then you'll hear it start and it'll go. And eventually it will stop. And it's supposed to stop. There's supposed to be a point where you can't hear it. That doesn't mean that the pressure is gone. It just means that you're not able to hear it anymore through the skin. So the systolic is the first sound you hear. The diastolic is the last sound you hear keep those terms in mind. Write them down, write it out, make a flashcard, whatever you got to do for that. But the systolic blood pressure is the top number. It's the first beat that you hear. Diastolic blood pressure is the bottom number and it's the last beat you hear. So our normal or average blood pressure for older adults, our systolic blood pressure needs to be under 120 and our diastolic under 90. So just keep in mind that everybody's normal can be different from the next person. 
So some different factors that will affect the blood pressure. It may be increased slightly with age due to some various factors. One of those factors can be either arteriosclerosis or atherosclerosis. Now these terms will go a little bit more in depth in chapter 15 with our um, different physical changes accompanying aging, but I like to talk about this during blood pressure just to make sure that people understand what happens that will affect the blood pressure. So the atherosclerosis is the buildup of the plaque deposits in your body, in your arteries. So if you have somebody that's eaten kind of a greasy fatty diet then, or well basically anything now, then you'll have those plaque buildups in your arteries and that will kind of narrow the blood flow through your artery. So think about if you're driving through a tunnel or you're driving on the interstate and there's an accident or going down Kellogg in Wichita and there's an accident. Everybody kind of bottlenecks. You all have to kind of slow down a whole lot because there's way too many people trying to get in one lane because you know they never just close one lane. They have to close at least two. So you've got all these people trying to funnel into one lane and there's a whole bunch of traffic. So then you have to slow down and some of us get a little angry with that. So then when you finally get through or you, you're maybe trying to push your way through, then you're having to exert a lot more um, force on your car trying to get through all of these different people. And then when you finally get through, then you might hit that accelerator and take off. So that's kind of like the blood flowing through the atherosclerotic area. It's having to slow down and kind of funnel and then it might take off. But beforehand, because the heart knows that that atherosclerotic area is there, it's going to push even harder to get it through because the heart's going to say, I can't be late for work. I need to get this blood where it needs to go. I don't care if there's all this traffic. You guys need to get out of my way. I'm going to go. I'm going to keep pushing until I can get through there. So that's going to increase your blood pressure. The other thing is the arteriosclerosis. The, so this is the hardening of the arteries. So say again, there's all this traffic on Kellogg and you know, we've got our three, three, three lanes, they're all open and maybe there's a wreck and you can't go onto the shoulder. The shoulder's closed. So you've got to stay confined in that area that you're at. You're, there's no flexibility of you moving or you have to stay in that lane. Your lane is the only one that's open and you've got to be in that lane Maybe there's some other congestion like that arteriosclerosis or the atherosclerosis, but your lane is rigid. There's those concrete barriers up on either side. You cannot move. That is what the arteriosclerosis is like. So that hardening of the arteries and the inflexibility. So that can make your blood pressure go up too because your heart's going to have to work that much harder against it. So exercise can also um, affect your blood pressure. Your, ex your blood pressure will naturally go up as you exercise. Um, also emotional distress. Think about when you're in that car on Kellogg, and I'm not trying to cause people emotional distress, just given an example. You're in that car, you're on Kellogg, you're in all that traffic. Your emotional distress is going to be tested with that. Some of us, it goes up a little bit more than others. So just kind of think about that. Some people may be able to say, oh, well, okay, I know things happen. I'll be all right. I'll just kind of, just kind of hang out here and, you know, make sure I stay safe. Some other people are going to say, no, I need to get where I'm going. I got to go. This is really making me anxious. This is making me mad. So their emotional distress level is going to be much higher than the person that can just stay calm in that situation. So another term is hypertension. This is abbreviated HTN. So if you remember back to your abbreviations, HTN means hypertension. And this is high blood pressure. So we see hyper means high, tension meaning pressure. 
So hypertension, HTN is high blood pressure. So this means your systolic pressure is above 140 and your diastolic pressure is over 90. So you will see a lot of older people that have hypertension and have that high blood pressure. You still need to remember to report those high blood pressures even if it is quote unquote normal for that person. That may mean that that person needs some different medications or strategies to try to get their blood pressure down because it's not good for them to just leave it that elevated. So one of the other things before we get to the hypo, uh, postural hypertension is, okay, what about the blood pressures that are not normal or hypertension? So between 120 and 140 systolic is called prehypertension. So your blood pressure is a little bit elevated, but you're not quite high yet. So prehypertension. That term you don't necessarily need to know for testing purposes, but just in case you're curious and kind of think about, you know, well, okay, normal's under 120, but high is over 140. What's in between? Prehypertension. One more term is going to be hypotension. So hypotension, there's no abbreviation for that one, but hypotension means low blood pressure. And this generally is going to be a systolic blood pressure of either under 90 or 100, depending on where your facility is at with what they want, and then a diastolic blood pressure under 60. So this is a low blood pressure or hypotension. This one you'll see a lot in people that have been long-term athletes. They will naturally have a lower blood pressure and sometimes a lower pulse, and that's okay. But just kind of keep in mind that again, what's normal for them may not be normal on our scales. So the last concept to talk about is postural hypotension or orthostatic hypotension. Now this one you'll see quite a bit in some of your residents, so we need to try to accommodate for it. So this means that the person's body is unable to rapidly adjust when you main, to maintain the normal blood pressure in the head when moving from lying to sitting or sitting to standing, and they may complain of dizziness or feeling faint, and some people actually pass out. So if you've ever been lying in bed, say it's in the morning, you've been fast asleep for eight hours, hopefully you can sleep that long uninterrupted, but you've been fast asleep and your alarm goes off and you jump out of bed to go turn it off. How many people have ever kind of felt a little funny, a little dizzy when they do that? That's that postural hypotension. Usually your blood pressure will kind of adjust really quickly for that, but older people it takes a lot longer for them to kind of adjust to that. So that's why when we get people out of bed, we want to take our time with it. Give them time to acclimate, give them time to adjust. Now there is one exception to that when we talk about taking blood pressures that I will go into more detail about. But generally, when we get people up out of bed, give them time to adjust. When we stand them from like a wheelchair to standing, give them time to adjust. Because it takes a lot longer for those elderly people to accommodate for that. So the different equipment that we're gonna use to measure blood pressure there's a piece called a sphygmomanometer. Now the sphygmomanometer is going to be the blood pressure cuff and the gauge. So this is gonna be the little dial with the needle in it. We do not expect you to be able to pronounce or spell sphygmomanometer, you know, perfectly. Just be able to recognize it for what it is. So if you see sphygmomanometer, it's a blood pressure cuff and gauge. Your other piece is gonna be your stethoscope. Now, this is the piece that you use to do the actual listening. And we'll teach you how to use the stethoscope and the blood pressure cuff um, at Skills Lab. So some different points of measuring the blood pressure, you always wanna have a cuff that's appropriate size. Make sure that you position it properly and hearing your sounds. And we do have a little video after this that talks about how to take a blood pressure that's really helpful, and then we'll practice that in Skills Lab. This is one thing that it's kind of hard to talk about. It's a lot easier to just do it hands-on. So also the time interval for rechecking. 
So say you check somebody's blood pressure and it's 80 over 40. So you go tell the nurse and they say, well, okay, just recheck it in a little bit. You know, you may wait 10 minutes, you may wait 20 minutes. Sometimes it's better just to ask the nurse exactly how long they want you to wait. But if you, generally if you have a blood pressure that's way outside the normals, if you have that really, really low one or you have a really, really high one, then usually you t wait just a few minutes. And I always like to check it on the other arm. Sometimes you can have discrepancies or differences between um, your arms. If you have maybe a blood flow issue to one arm that's causing a really, really low reading or you know something causing a really, really high reading. But I like to recheck both arms if I've got the chance and usually just wait a couple minutes between. Because if you take that blood pressure on somebody's arm and it's reading high and you immediately take it right after, their blood pressure is still gonna be elevated from the last time or their anxiety is going to be up from taking the blood pressure again right away. And it, sometimes those blood pressure cuffs, if you have to pump them really high, it hurts. So that's going to cause your blood pressure to go up the second time too. So you might want to wait a few minutes, use the other arm, and then recheck it. So when you're reporting and recording your blood pressure, you always want to report to the nurse any changes in the blood pressure from what's normal for them. And this would be a systolic pressure of 100 and of under 100 or over 190. And I personally would not wait that long if somebody had 190 systolic blood pressure. I would want to know sooner than that. I would want to know maybe if it was 160. But you always will want to go by the facility policy and go by the care plan because the person's care plan may have uh, a limit of where they want you to report. So it's not gonna hurt you to report a blood pressure of 160 to your nurse, even if you know the person doesn't have any parameters until 170 to report. That's just something that you'll learn over time of when your nurses want you to report and when your facility wants you to report as well. So you always wanna report any diastolic pressure of under 60 or over 100. You wanna notify the nurse if you have any difficulty hearing or measuring the blood pressure and you want to record or document the blood pressure measurement. Even if you do report it to your nurse, you still need to record it. So you always write this as systolic over diastolic. So if you have a systolic of 120, diastolic of 80, 120 slash 80. That's how you would record that. One last thing that I want to talk about before we go on from blood pressures is when you do the blood pressures and we will teach you exactly how to do the blood pressures. Um, we want you to do them correctly, of course, do all of the you know, positioning of the cuff and everything like that, but orthostatic vitals. This is something that I don't believe is in your book, but this is something that you will definitely need to know to be a good CNA. If you have somebody that has problems with all of the um, blood pressure issues and maybe they get dizzy when they stand up, then you might need to do some orthostatic vitals. So what that means is you would have your resident um, lying in bed, take a blood pressure and a pulse. So make sure that your resident has been lying in bed for a while. This is best done first thing in the morning before somebody gets up for the day um, or maybe after a nap or they've been laying in bed for a couple hours. So take a blood pressure and pulse while they're lying in bed. Then you sit them up. Don't give them time to adjust. Of course, we, you know, we don't want to sit them up so quick, but sit them up. Take their blood pressure and pulse again. Stand them up. Take their blood pressure and pulse again. You have to do it in this order. Lying, sitting, standing. Otherwise, it's not going to be accurate. So what we're looking for is we're looking for the difference between their lying to sitting and sitting to standing blood pressures to see how much it drops. That can give us a good indication of whether or not they're having those orthostatic issues and if they need to be on any kind of medication or something, you know, further monitoring for that. So that's how to do orthostatic vitals. And I know we really haven't talked about on here exactly how to do the blood pressures. Again, this is something that's a lot better for skills lab so that we can 
really go through it with you and be hands-on with it. So bring your stethoscopes to skills labs when you come. So measuring height. This is a frequency of measurement that can be done on admission and maybe annually. Generally on admission and that's about it. So changes such as osteoporosis, and osteoporosis is a um, decrease in the bone density. So changes such as osteoporosis can decrease the resident's height. So if you've ever seen older people that kind of stoop over or they're kind of shrinking, that can be due to osteoporosis and some other issues. So a resident who's able to stand can be measured using the height bar at the standing balance scale. And then someone who's unable to stand can be measured in bed, flat on their back, and measured from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. So the nurse will help you with this if you have to um, perform the in-bed me measurement. So you always want to record or document the measurement using either the standard, which would be your feet and inches, or the metric, which would be centimeters, um, according to your facility policy. This concludes our PowerPoint presentation on measuring or recording vital signs. There will be another presentation right after this that will talk about the pulse ox and how to check somebody for pain. Um, so just read that one as well. And then we also have a video on how to check blood pressures, which we will practice a lot at our skills lab. So thank you for your time. And please notify us if you have any questions, and we look forward to seeing you in Skills Lab. Have a good day.